Today I'm going to be talking about money from an evolutionary perspective. The title of this talk is uh, Bitcoin, a new species of money. So this topic is something that I've been thinking about for quite a while, and I have a, a great interest in the subject of evolutionary biology, but um, I'm not a biologist. Um, and there are probably no biologists in the audience, which is a good thing, because I will say things that will probably um, upset biologists, because I'll get them wrong. Uh, so I'm speaking in general terms, and this is more a narrative to help you understand where things are going. So something really important happened on January 3rd, 2009. The world changed. But as with many fundamental and significant changes in the world, very few people noticed, almost no one noticed. That change started out as a small ripple, and it started spreading. And now we are here seven years later, and that small change, Bitcoin, is radically rewriting human history and human society. We are part of something unique, we are part of something really special that started as an idea that even the author of this idea didn't believe it would work. And all of the people who looked at the idea and looked at the theory behind Bitcoin had many many things to say about how it wouldn't work. And on the internet some of the most interesting things are things that do not work in theory but do work in practice. My favorite example is Wikipedia. If you think about Wikipedia objectively, based on what you know about human knowledge, it shouldn't work. Why would anyone spend their time for free writing an article about a single Pokemon card for months? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. And yet, people do that. We underestimate human nature sometimes. Bitcoin is like that. In theory, it's difficult to understand how it works, but in practice, it has spawned a revolution. It has created something very new. The era before Bitcoin can be characterized by a short-lived period of time, which started in the beginning of the 20th century with the introduction of central banking. And for the first time, money became completely detached from commodity, and became managed on a national basis by central banks. This was a very different model than we had before, and it continues to this day. Many of us in Bitcoin believe that when we look back a hundred years from now, we will see central banking as a short-lived and not particularly successful experiment. What Bitcoin started is different, not because it replaces central banking, but because it opens the door to a new form of competition. A form of competition where money can be created on the internet by anyone, and be instantaneously global, unforgeable, open, and secure. And with that new system, we not only created a new form of money, but we also created a new environmental niche for money to compete in. In my opinion, with the invention of internet money, we now start to see the first model for a network-centric evolution of money, where different forms of money compete as species. And they compete by finding an environmental niche and adapting to that niche through simple competition. And this has never happened before. The reason it's never happened before is because the environment was hostile to that form of money. Borders, geography, nation states limited the ability of money to spread and compete with other money on a global basis. And what happened on January 3, 2009 was a very significant event because what it did is 
It fundamentally changed the environment in which money competes. And the best counterexample or similar example I can show is a very special moment for the history of this planet when the levels of oxygen in the atmosphere started rising and they gave the possibility of aerobic metabolism aerobic metabolism meaning that species could now metabolize with oxygen and before that all species were anaerobic they metabolized without oxygen they lived in an oxygen free environment and for them in fact oxygen is toxic oxygen is an oxidizer it's poison to an anaerobic organism it's like an acid it destroys them what happened when the environment changed to allow aerobic metabolism was suddenly a whole new environment opened up for species to compete species that were not competing with the previous species because they operated in a completely different niche and they had a significant advantage because aerobic metabolism is an order of magnitude more efficient and within a very short period of time the planet changed and aerobic organisms got pushed into the deepest crevices of the world. They still exist at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, buried in glaciers, inside volcanoes, in places where oxygen doesn't reach. They still exist. They haven't gone away. But this is now a planet of oxygen-breathing organisms. The world changed. And one of the interesting things about evolution is that it doesn't work in a linear fashion. It works through a process that has been called punctuated equilibrium. Things have equilibrium for a long time, and then suddenly there is a great rush of evolution. As a lot of things change, new environments open up, and species evolve very rapidly in a short period of time, and then they reach equilibrium again, and persist for thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, and then again something changes some environmental factors, some external stimulus, some advance in evolution. <coughs> Species able to create DNA instead of RNA, oxygen in the atmosphere, or, for the dinosaurs, a meteor, <laughs> or other <laughs> geological event. <laughs> On the 3rd of January 2009, a meteor appeared in the sky of our society. <laughs> and until that time, banks were the kings of this planet, like giant lumbering dinosaurs, completely dominating for hundreds of millions of years. With complete disregard, even contempt, for the tiny little Mammals. For the tiny little furry mammals that they routinely step on as they walk around the planet. But something has changed, and very soon those mammals will inherit the earth. In this new environment, we don't compete against banks with Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin is adapted to a different environmental niche. Bitcoin is not the money of the physical space. It is the money of the internet. Bitcoin is not the money of the nation-state. It is the money of the world. Bitcoin is not the money of the current generation. It is the money of the generations to come. And it doesn't compete against banking, because for Bitcoin, banking and borders and physical money are irrelevant, just like to mammals, dinosaurs were irrelevant, and to aerobic bacteria, anaerobic bacteria are irrelevant, unless they are suitable as food. When you look at this environmental niche, you have to realize that it is not just one species of money, not just one new species of money, Bitcoin, but an explosion in the ecology of money. 
On January 3rd, 2009, there were 194 currencies. Today, there are more than 3,000 currencies. And of those, all but 194 are digital, decentralized internet monies. They are the new species that live on the internet. And most of them will go extinct. Most of them will disappear. But they will continue to evolve independently. When you look at the evolution of money in this environment, you have to realize that there are many factors that affect this evolution. One of the factors is us, human beings. We give these things life. This evolution is not evolution by random mutation. It is directed evolutions by designers. In this room, there are people who are directing the evolution of these new currencies. And in doing so, they are responding to environmental stimuli. Supply, demand, the needs of customers, the applications that they have in mind, untapped markets and opportunities that traditional currencies can't fit in. And they direct the evolution of these currencies in that direction in order to take advantage of these new niches. But there's also a broader environment, because at the same time that these new currencies are evolving, the old currencies are in crisis. We are now facing an unprecedented currency crisis around the world that is affecting hundreds of currencies, hundreds of countries. And it is affecting every central bank. We are in an environment that hasn't happened in the last 200 years. When I was growing up and I was studying just some basic macroeconomics, economic orthodoxy said that the lowest you can go with interest rates is zero, and you never go there. Never go full zero. And yet, now, 20, 24 different central banks are at zero, and not just temporarily, some of them for eight years, some of them longer. I think the Japanese bank is the longest at zero, and some of them have also gone negative. Never go full negative. Interest rates wasn't orthodox economics until a couple of years ago. It was unthinkable. Bitcoin is not going to destroy central banks. Bitcoin doesn't give a damn about central banks. Central banks are doing a pretty good job destroying themselves. <laughs> and the reason is because we live in a world where billions of people have no access to finance, have no access to banking, have no access to traditional financial instruments. They operate entirely in cash in a single currency, isolated from the rest of the world. And that is an environment into which Bitcoin can thrive. We are not going after the environmental niche of traditional banking, because there is a bigger environmental niche. The gray economy is more than 60% of the economy in the world. The unbanked, debanked, and underbanked are the majority. The disenfranchised, disempowered are the majority. And that is the niche that Bitcoin is tapping into. And we will continue to serve the needs of people who are not being served today. Some of us because that is a matter of principle or ideology. Some of us simply because it is a matter of supply and demand. And it is the prudent, sensible, and profitable thing to do. In this evolution of currencies, we are going to see external stimulus. And one of the most important things to keep in mind is that these new currencies will be attacked. And they are being attacked with misinformation and propaganda, and in some countries with direct attacks, with legal attacks, with extra legal attacks outside of the judicial system. 
These new currencies remove power from people and organizations that are accustomed to power. And therefore, they represent a threat. Who do they represent a threat to? Really, the question you should ask yourself is, what kind of government and what kind of organization is threatened by the idea of people having independent financial control and empowerment over their own money? A government that is threatened by that is threatened by the fundamental concepts of the Renaissance, of the Enlightenment. Freedom of association, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of commerce. A government that is offended by freedom is not a government I want to support. Now, arguably, most of the governments in the West today are not hostile to Bitcoin. They're curious. They don't understand it. They want to see how it can be fit into the status quo. They want to tame it, control it, co-opt it. And in other countries where it represents a more serious threat, because it represents freedom, Bitcoin is illegal, with very heavy penalties. But one of the things about an evolutionary system is that it doesn't stand still. And if you introduce into the environment a predator, then the system evolves to defend itself against the predator. If the predator is an attempt to identify every user of the system, which is antithetical to the evolution of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, they will evolve to become more stealthy and more anonymous. If you isolate a cryptocurrency, you trigger a specific type of accelerated evolution. We've seen this happen with species too. Species that became isolated, for example, on the continent of Australia, with fierce competition for very limited resources, evolved to be the world's most venomous, poisonous, and dangerous animals in the world. Everything in Australia is trying to kill you. <laughs> and Australians actually love to remind tourists of this. They even make up species that don't exist just to scare tourists. But why did species in Australia evolve that way? Because they were isolated and pressured. And so when you isolate and pressure something, it adapts. And it adapts by increasing its stealth, increasing its venom, increasing its resistance. Bitcoin already has an element of evolution that is quite effective. In the current regulatory system, banks that try to swallow Bitcoin get indigestion. It doesn't kill them, but it certainly makes their tummy hurt. And so Bitcoin can't be adopted, co-opted, and absorbed by the traditional banking system, which is a huge advantage in evolution, because it means that we can continue to do our own thing without worrying about that being swallowed by the traditional system. And this comes as a huge surprise to traditional banking. Because over the past 50 years, they've been accustomed to swallowing any type of competition. Uh, and they can't swallow this one. It doesn't taste good. So when we look at the evolution of money, we see this explosion, thousands of new currencies. And this will continue. We will have thousands and then tens of thousands, and then possibly hundreds of thousands of currencies. And you think about that, and it doesn't make any sense. If you look at it from the traditional perspectives of money, how can you have hundreds of thousands of currencies? That doesn't make any sense. How could they possibly have value? And what happens is fragmentation. They have value, but to a smaller and smaller group. Which actually is the normal behavior of money. Money is something that emerges among small groups. The idea of one money for an entire nation is relatively new. If you watch children in kindergarten, they develop their own money. 
They develop their own culture of money. They trade rubber bands and Pokemon cards and cubes. They use it as a language to express themselves. So out of the hundreds of thousands of currencies that will evolve in this space, the vast majority will have no real economic value in funny quotes outside of the small unit that uses them. Maybe some will represent your most favored football team, which in this city is Milan. In some cities, that's a dangerous question to ask, because half the room says one team, the other half says the other team, and then fistfights break out. But fortunately, this was not a problem here. But you can imagine currencies that represent loyalty, currencies that represents loyalty to an artist, loyalty to a sports team, loyalty to a friend, loyalty to a business. You can imagine currencies that are used to represent commodities or assets, to represent sharing tokens for a taxi service, to represent all kinds of things that we haven't imagined yet. This is a completely new space. And out of these hundreds of thousands of currencies, we will see some that will behave very much like traditional money, in that they will be used as the primary means of exchange, store of value for societies. But these will not be geographic societies. These will be societies of common purpose. These will be adhocracies and groups that exist on the internet, beyond borders, beyond nation-states. We now see the emergence of the first opportunity for the cosmopolitan class and the cosmopolitan-minded people to have a cosmopolitan currency. A currency that belongs to the world, not a single nation. And we will see these types of things emerge. And they do not compete against traditional currencies. We are not going to replace the euro with Bitcoin. In fact, that would be a disaster. That would be even worse than the euro, arguably. <laughs> And the reason is because the fundamental failing of world money is the imposition of monopoly and centralized control. And the fundamental evolutionary characteristic of the new money is decentralization and choice. And that's why we do not compete for the same environment. We create our own environment. When you think of these forms of new electronic money, the instinctive thought at first is to evaluate them in the context of traditional money. How many euros is a bitcoin today? Everybody in this room knows that question or that answer. And that shows that we are still evaluating bitcoin in the context of traditional money. We are still assuming that if we earn we will probably earn in traditional currencies. We will convert. We will then convert again and spend in traditional currencies. And with that thought, you have to think about exchange rates and volatility. Well, I'm one of the people who doesn't do that much anymore. There aren't many of us, probably just a few thousand. For the last three years, I have been earning my income in Bitcoin. For the last two, I have been earning it almost entirely in Bitcoin. Gradually, the vast majority of my spending also happens in Bitcoin. And in many cases, it is priced in traditional currencies. But as time goes by, increasingly it is not. Increasingly, I am using Bitcoin to buy Ethereum. I'm using Bitcoin to buy services, disk space, websites, bandwidth, VPNs, etc. And in those questions, the only thing that matters to me is purchasing power. Which means that gradually, in my mind, Bitcoin has started to evolve from a simple means of exchange that I trans translate into another currency to a store of value that has its own purchasing power completely independently. 
One day, this transition will happen completely for a few people, and then for more people, and then for more people. And we will build an economy operating and denominated entirely in digital currencies, entirely on the internet, never exchanging, never touching the traditional banking system, outside the system. And on that day, the answer to the question, how much is one Bitcoin worth, will be 1,000 millibits. <laughs> we have made that transition. You will have to explain this to your children. They won't have to explain it to their children. They will have to explain paper money to their children. Just like I would have to explain VHS and fax machines to younger people. Just like I realize how old I am when I get to a traffic stop and I want to ask the other person for directions and I go and this doesn't mean anything anymore because we haven't had a window that opens like that on a car for 25 years. <laughs> and if the person I'm making that motion to is older, they get what I mean, but to a young person it's like <laughs> <laughs> These things are the relics of old thinking. And the thing about this is that you don't notice that you are bathed in the relics of old thinking until you have an opportunity to step outside of that context. And Bitcoin is giving us that opportunity. Bitcoin is the vehicle by which we step outside of the traditional notions of money tied to geography and nation, controlled by a central bank with intermediaries of trust. We step outside of these and we reevaluate fundamental truths. What does it mean to trust? What does it mean to have authority in a system that is network centric? What does it mean to express value on a global basis? And as we enter that new context, we are evolving as a society. We are now moving into the environmental niche of the cryptocurrency. Thank you.